Happy Saturday. A couple of Saturdays ago, we replayed our episode on Thomas Harriet because he'd been mentioned in our new episode on Evangelista Torricelli. Someone that came up a few times in that classic episode was Sir Walter Raleigh. Yeah. Yeah, over the weekend, I was doing dishes. It's like, why do I keep thinking about Beth Throckmorton's secret baby? Oh, yeah, it was because I had re-listened to that Thomas Harriet <laughs> episode for classics. Yeah, so for anyone who wants to fill in the gaps on all of the voyages, those secret marriages, the imprisonment, and the beheadings, they were only briefly mentioned in the Thomas Harriet episode. Here is our episode on the beheading of Sir Walter Raleigh, which originally came out October 24th, 2018. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, As folks probably know, I grew up in North Carolina and its capital, Raleigh, is named after Sir Walter Raleigh. And aside from that fact, here are the things I could have told you about Sir Walter Raleigh before researching today's podcast. Number one, he wrote some poems. I probably could not name any of them if I tried. (laughs) There's actually a reason for that. He, on purpose, didn't publish most of them during his lifetime. He tried to keep his name out of it. But anyway, anyway, I knew he wrote some poems. Couldn't really say which ones. Number two, he was Queen Elizabeth I's favorite. And this one time, he put a cloak down over a puddle so she wouldn't get her feet wet. That's probably not even true. And it never made sense to me as a child because I was like, cloaks are not waterproof. She's just going to step on that and her feet are still going to get wet and his cloak is ruined. So I'm going to get a little nerdy with you right now. Oh, yeah? Because a lot of times the textile weaves at that time were really tight compared to what we would have today. So Uh for at least a moment, it would have prevented water from seeping through. Awesome. Would not have been waterproof. No. But for as long as it took her delicate little feet to cross over the, the offending puddle she probably would have been covered. Thank you for resolving that question (laughs) I've had since I was maybe five. Uh, But anyway, that's probably not even true. We're going to get to that later. And the number three is sort of a, like, blah, blah, something Roanoke colony. Like, I just had a very vague understanding of Sir Walter Raleigh, even though I grew up in a place whose capital is named after him. Among other things, Sir Walter Raleigh was a courtier and an explorer and a historian and a member of Parliament, which we're not going to even get into that part today really at all. Also a soldier. He was part of England's defense against the Spanish Armada, as well as the Tudor conquest of Ireland, some of which was truly horrifying. Very conveniently, since this episode is coming out in October, according to some people, he's a ghost now. And we are also coming up on the 400th anniversary of his beheading which is why he's making an appearance on the show today. He's a scary, headless ghost. He is. Walter Raleigh was born about 1554 in Devonshire, England. Some sources put that day as January 22nd, but the year remains a little murky. His parents were Walter and Catherine Raleigh, and the younger Walter was the third of their surviving children. He also had half-siblings from his parents' previous marriages. Walter was the youngest boy of all of these siblings and half-siblings. Their family was part of the Protestant gentry, and they weren't particularly well-off or prominent, but they had been in Devonshire for a very long time, and they had a lot of connections to people who were more well-off and more well-known. We don't know much at all about Walter's childhood or youth, but he eventually went to Oriel College, Oxford. He didn't finish his studies, though. In 1569, he went to France with the Devon Volunteers to fight on the side of the Huguenots in the French Wars of Religion. He served for about five years, seeing two major battles and surviving the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. In 1576, Raleigh was back in London, and he was enrolled at the Middle Temple, which was one of the four ends of court. But it doesn't seem like he was really studying law while he was there, which would have been a normal thing to be doing at the Middle Temple. He was more treating it kind of like a gentleman's club. Even though he never seems to have finished a course of study at Oxford or at the Middle Temple, he would go on to really develop a reputation for being very highly educated. Maybe he was just good at PR. I'm super smart, you guys. I've studied a bunch. 
Can I go get a drink? Uh, Raleigh published his first poem in the 1570s as well. It was printed in the preface to The Steel Glass by George Gascoigne, and the poem appears under the heading, Walter Raleigh of the Middle Temple in Commendation of the Steel Glass, with Raleigh spelled R-A-W-L-E-Y. This is one of, no joke, 70 different spellings of Walter Raleigh's name in the historical record. And as a side note, the common spelling of R-A-L-E-I-G-H is not one that he used himself. He never signed his name with an I in it. Raleigh is also pronounced slightly differently depending on where you are from. I will tell you I struggle with it because we have a cat named Raleigh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I say it that way all the time, even though he is, in fact, named after Imagineer Roly Crump. But saying it Roly just doesn't feel right with the cat. I don't know why. (laughs) Well, and an odd thing that I discovered... Uh, Even though a lot of search technologies are good at interpreting your different spellings to give you results that are what you're looking for, there are meaningfully different responses for Walter Raleigh spelled R-A-L-E-I-G-H and Walter Raleigh spelled uh, R-A-L-E-G-H with no I in it which uh, meant that I got to redo all of my searching partway through this process. (laughs) I was like... Why didn't I find this paper before? Because I had an eye in it. In 1578, Raleigh and his half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, went on an expedition, possibly to try to find the Northwest Passage. But this expedition was largely a failure. Storms forced their little fleet of ships back to Plymouth almost immediately after they left. And then they turned to what multiple writers describe as unauthorized privateering against Spanish ships. Not sure who decided to call it unauthorized privateering. That's just piracy. (laughs) This unauthorized privateering brought them a lot of casualties and very little reward. So their reception wasn't particularly favorable when they got back to England. Plus, Raleigh, who had already had a reputation for being stubborn and hot-headed, kept getting in trouble for disturbing the peace and dueling. He wound up spending time in both fleet and Marshall Sea prisons for brawling. Possibly to try to keep him out of all this trouble, some of Raleigh's friends secured a commission for him as a captain in the army, and he was sent to Ireland. The Tudor conquest of Ireland was going on. It had started long before Queen Elizabeth ascended to the throne in 1558. Part of Ireland was solely under English control, and the English part of Ireland, which was mostly around Dublin, was known as the Pale, So the Tudor conquest was meant to expand the Pale and also to solidify English rule within the Pale. Uh, Side note, a lot of people believe that the phrase beyond the Pale is a specific reference to this part of Ireland and the areas beyond it. But according to the Oxford English Dictionary, that is not supported by historical evidence. It is probably an association that people made later. During the Tudor conquest, the province of Munster in the southwest of Ireland saw two major rebellions against English rule, and they were known as the Desmond Rebellions. The first one took place from 1569 to 1573, and Raleigh's half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, was knighted for his service in that rebellion. The second Desmond Rebellion started in 1579, and it was fueled both by resistance to English rule and by the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Gerald Fitzgerald, the Earl of Desmond, had gotten the support of the Pope and of King Philip II of Spain in this uprising. Raleigh served with the English army during several engagements in the Second Desmond Rebellion, but the most notorious of these engagements was the Siege of Smerwick. Troops from Spain and Italy who were aiding the Fitzgeralds were being garrisoned at Smerwick, and Queen Elizabeth had sent English troops to put down this rebellion, including dealing with these troops. When the Spanish and Italian forces stood down, Lord Arthur Gray, the Lord Deputy of Ireland, ordered for all of them to be massacred. This was 100% how England dealt with the rebels at the time. Had England been at war with Spain or Italy, the soldiers would have been offered some protection under the rules of war. But they weren't. In the Crown's view, they were helping royal subjects rebel against their monarch, so they needed to be dealt with quickly, efficiently, and decisively. Seriously, Tudor England's treatment of Irish rebels could be extremely brutal. In the first Desmond Rebellion, Sir Humphrey Gilbert was known to decapitate civilians who supported the rebels and then display their heads on pikes along the path to his tent. 
Two companies, totaling about 180 men, were tasked with killing the enemy soldiers at Smerwick. Walter Raleigh was one of the two captains in charge. The English army massacred about 600 people after this siege. About 100 of them were women and children. Raleigh was also one of the English officers granted lands in Ireland after the end of the Second Desmond Rebellion. His allotment was actually the largest of any of the ones that were granted out of the Munster lands that were claimed after all of this was over. He also helped govern the province of Munster after this, and when he went back to London, he positioned himself as an expert in Irish affairs, which might have been part of what got him into such close confidence with Queen Elizabeth. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more after we first pause for a little sponsor break. Like we said at the top of the show, the Raleigh family wasn't all that prominent, but they did have some pretty high-up connections. One of these connections was Catherine Astley. She was Walter's aunt on his mother's side, and she had been Queen Elizabeth's governess back when she was still a princess, starting before Walter was born. After Elizabeth became queen, Astley became the chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber and then the chief gentlewoman of the bedchamber, and it might have been Catherine Astley who introduced Walter Raleigh to Queen Elizabeth. The introduction may also have been a byproduct of Raleigh's military service. After the massacre at Smerwick, Raleigh and his men searched through the bodies of the soldiers and collected letters and other documents to deliver to London. Raleigh was the one who carried them there, which he did in December of 1580. Regardless of exactly how Raleigh made his first connection to Queen Elizabeth, he quickly became a favorite. He was very tall and handsome, flamboyant, and quite the flatterer. Soon, Elizabeth just didn't want him to leave her side. In 1582, Sir Humphrey Gilbert put together a scheme to resettle English Catholics in North America, and Raleigh invested some money in it, but the Queen forbade him from personally going on the voyage. When she sent him on a mission to the Low Countries later that year, she told him to write to her every day. Through the 1580s, Raleigh continued to get more and more recognition and favors from the Queen. He was knighted on February 6, 1585. He was also made warden of the Stanneries, or coal mining districts, in Devon and Cornwall. He was also named Lord Lieutenant of Cornwall and Vice Admiral of the West. On top of all that, the Queen granted Raleigh multiple estates in England and Ireland, including Durham Place on the Strand, which was one of her favorite residences. She also gave him a monopoly on the sale of wine licenses and on the export of broadcloth, and a lot of this was very lucrative. I mean, fabric and wine, and he's got this thing covered. Um, In the middle of all of this, in September 1583, Sir Humphrey Gilbert drowned in a shipwreck. He had recently claimed Newfoundland for England, and he had a royal charter to try to colonize it. After his death, Raleigh was granted a charter to explore and colonize North America. He was given, quote, free liberty and license from time to time and at all times forever hereafter to discover, search, find out, and view such remote, heathen, and barbarous lands, countries, and territories not actually possessed of any Christian prince nor inhabited by Christian people. This was England's first meaningful attempt to establish a colony in North America. Yeah, his half-brother had been kind of dabbling at this idea of colonizing Newfoundland, and there had, of course, been lots of voyages back and forth between Europe and North America. But in terms of England attempting to establish a colony, this was the first serious effort. So Raleigh first mounted a reconnaissance expedition in 1584, and that landed on the outer banks of what's now North Carolina. This reconnaissance expedition returned with at least two indigenous men, known as Mantio and Wanchies, They stayed at one of Raleigh's residences when they arrived in England. Mantio and Wanchis were two of the first indigenous Americans to be brought to England, and they each obviously have their own stories outside the scope of Walter Raleigh's. Both of them returned to North America with Raleigh's next voyage in 1585. The 1585 voyage was intended to establish a colony, but this colony failed. The indigenous peoples in the area were divided in their opinions of the colonists, and this was also true of Mantio and Wanchis. Mantio stayed with the colony to work as an interpreter and a guide, but Wanchis left and warned his people that the English should not be trusted. Aside from this division and their relationships with the indigenous people in the area, the colony was also struck by illness, 
and a lack of planning and supplies, when Sir Francis Drake coincidentally passed through the area on his way back from the Caribbean, most of the colonists took the opportunity to go back to England with him. Mantio returned to England with Sir Francis Drake also. Raleigh planned one more expedition to North America, and Mantio traveled on that expedition. These colonists arrived in August of 1587 and became the famous lost colony of Roanoke. The colony's governor, John White, was sent back to England for more supplies. But England was at war with Spain by the time that he got there. And when White finally got back to North America in 1590, the colony was gone, with the word Croatoan carved into a post as the only evidence that anyone had ever been there. Archaeologists tried to work out exactly what happened, and this comes up from time to time on Unearthed. It's one of every history buff's favorite mysteries. (laughs) Uh, Partly to bring tourists (laughs) see an outdoor drama and to launch an entire TV series. (laughs) So these expeditions are why Walter Raleigh is often incorrectly credited with introducing potatoes and tobacco to England and Ireland specifically or to Europe in general. But uh, number one, he didn't go on any of these personally. The Queen did not want him to go. But potatoes were introduced to Spain more than a decade before these voyages took place. And Ireland had also established trade with Spain before Raleigh's voyages. So it's entirely possible that there were potatoes in Ireland before ships from Raleigh's expeditions arrived there with potatoes on board. And there were definitely potatoes elsewhere in Europe, for sure, way before any of this happened. Tobacco was also introduced to Europe long before Raleigh's voyages and had been grown in England for more than 10 years before his first ships left for North America. Raleigh probably did help popularize its use in England, though. So, uh, like I said earlier, Walter Raleigh didn't go on any of these actual voyages, and even though they weren't particularly successful, his position continued to rise at court while he stayed behind. In 1586 or 1587, Raleigh was made captain of the Queen's personal guard. The Anglo-Spanish War started just before that happened in 1585, and Raleigh served on the War Council. He also helped organize the Devon Militia to fight against the Spanish Armada in 1588. He also commissioned a ship called the Ark Raleigh that he gave to the Queen, who renamed it the Ark Royal and made it the flagship of the British naval fleet. Throughout all of this, Raleigh was making friends and enemies at and outside of court. He was friends with poet Edmund Spencer and introduced him to Queen Elizabeth. Spencer was later named Poet Laureate, and he wrote The Fairy Queen, one of the great epic poems in English, in part as an allegory about Queen Elizabeth I and the Tudors. Raleigh also wrote a couple of commendatory sonnets for the Fairy Queen, and he makes a number of appearances in Spencer's work. And as a side note, Spencer also served England during the Desmond Rebellion as Lord Grey's secretary. If you had to read the Fairy Queen, just hypothetically, when you were studying literature in college and you didn't find it a particularly enjoyable experience, you could just blame Walter Raleigh for having made all that possible. And I do. (laughs) So on the other end of this spectrum was Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, who was sometimes Raleigh's friend and sometimes really his adversary and always his rival for the Queen's attention. The disputes that Raleigh started having with Essex almost led them to a duel. And then there was the relationship that caused Raleigh to fall out of the Queen's favor almost for good. He started a secret relationship with Elizabeth Throckmorton, known as Bess, one of the Queen's maids of honor. She wasn't supposed to marry without the Queen's approval, but when she became pregnant with Raleigh's child, they got married in secret, and Bess left the court to give birth. Bess delivered a son named Damery, we're not sure on that pronunciation, on March 29, 1592. And this was during the better part of Raleigh's relationship with the Earl of Essex, who was the baby's godfather. Bess came back to court in April, and she and Walter both tried to keep their marriage and baby secret from the Queen. Of course, that idea was doomed to failure. Walter and Bess apologized to the Queen after she found out that they were secretly married and had a secret baby, but neither of them seemed all that sincere about their apology, and that just made things worse. So Queen Elizabeth had them imprisoned in separate quarters in the Tower of London. 
Walter was released from the tower after one of his ships returned to port with a massive Portuguese ship in tow, the Madre de Dios. There were concerns that Raleigh's crew was going to mutiny, so he was released to go down to the docks and try to keep everything in order. And once the queen took most of the treasure, she finally released both Walter and Bess from the tower, although she banished Walter from court and stripped him of all his estates and privileges. The Raleighs went back to his home of Devonshire, and sadly, Damery Raleigh died while still a baby. While banished from court, Walter Raleigh spent some time hanging out with some of the most notable literary figures of the time, including William Shakespeare and Ben Jonson. Although he was banned from court until 1597, Raleigh figured out a way he might win back the Queen's good graces in 1595. And we're going to get to that after we take another little pause for a sponsor break. In February of 1595, Walter Raleigh got the Queen's permission to go on an expedition on the Orinoco River in what's now Venezuela, which at the time was known as Guiana. He was searching for the fabled city of El Dorado, and Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, went on this expedition as well. This is one of the times that they were getting along. They did not find a city of gold, though, but Raleigh did write a book called The Discovery of Guiana, which came out in 1596. This book was extremely popular, and it was reprinted four times that year. He also seems to have brought an indigenous boy of about 10 or 12 back with him, who he might have adopted. The Anglo-Spanish War was still ongoing, and Raleigh and Essex were both part of a raid on the Spanish port of Cadiz in 1596, which destroyed more than 30 Spanish ships. Raleigh was seriously wounded in the thigh, which never fully healed. But this was a victory for England, and a somewhat lucrative one, so he did start to win back some of the Queen's affections. She eventually allowed him back to court and restored him to his position as the captain of the Queen's Guard. With things starting to turn around after this Orinoco expedition and the raid on Cadiz, soon Elizabeth was starting to bestow more favors on Walter Raleigh again, including making him the governor of the Isle of Jersey in 1600, and she granted him a monopoly on playing cards as well. I'm telling you, with the fabric and the wine and the playing cards, he really had the entertainment market cornered. Um, Then in 1601, the Earl of Essex rebelled against the Queen, and Raleigh helped put down that rebellion. Essex was executed for treason. The Queen was devastated, but this meant that Raleigh's chief rival at court was dead. Raleigh was widely reported as gloating over Essex's execution, but in reality, he seems to have been a little more conflicted over it. The two men had really been close earlier on in their lives, and Raleigh didn't attend the execution, even though he was expected to as captain of the Queen's Guard. But Raleigh's return to relative favor at court was pretty short-lived because Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. James I of England and VI of Scotland became king, And James didn't particularly like Raleigh. Raleigh also had a lot of enemies at court, some of whom had convinced the king that Raleigh was ready to back a rival claimant to the throne. This rumor was not particularly realistic. It involved a Spanish claimant to the throne, and Raleigh had spent much of his military career fighting against Spain. He was also against the idea of England ending the ongoing Anglo-Spanish War, and he even wrote a treatise about it. So the idea that he would support a Spanish monarch while also advocating continuing the war with Spain just doesn't make much sense. But soon, Raleigh had way bigger problems than these rumors. In November of 1603, he was charged with treason in a plot to overthrow King James. This plot was known as the Main Plot, M-A-I-N. It got its name because of its relationship to a lesser, weirder plot known as the Bi Plot. And that's by like B Y E (laughs) Bi. Like, (laughs) yes. It cracks me up that the names that they settled on for these two plots are solely about their relationship to one another, and neither of them is about what the plot was actually meant to involve. Yeah. The Bi Plot was discovered first, and it was a conspiracy among Catholic priests and lay people to kidnap the king in the spring of 1603. Their goal was to force him to grant religious tolerance to Catholics and Puritans and to place Catholics in office. 
On July 18, 1603, George Brooke was giving testimony about this plot, and as he was doing so, he revealed that his brother, Henry Brooke, Lord Cobham, was involved in a whole different plot, which was to kidnap the king, murder him, and replace him with Lady Arbella Stewart. <laughs> there were no real connections between the main plot and the byplot, except for the fact that George and Henry Brooke were brothers, and each of them was involved in one of these plots, and that the authorities found out about the main plot while investigating the byplot <laughs> because of the connection between the brothers Brooke. This is one of those things that if you wrote it in a farce, people would be like, too far. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the whole thing is so weird and convoluted. During months of interrogations, Kaba made and retracted a whole huge string of ever-changing confessions and accusations against Raleigh. The most consistent and possibly believable charge was that Raleigh sought out a pension from Spain in exchange for providing information about British activities in the Low Countries or the Indies. After Queen Elizabeth died, Raleigh had once again lost most of his estates and monopolies and other favors. He needed money, and it's possible that he needed it badly enough to be willing to exchange information for it, even to the Spanish. Raleigh was arrested based on Cobham's accusations. I mean, even though they kept changing and he kept recanting them and then having a completely different story, the fact that he was implicating himself while making these accusations made people believe it more. So Raleigh was arrested. He was imprisoned in the Tower on July 20th of 1603. About a week later, he tried to stab himself with a table knife, but he struck a rib and didn't do a lot of lasting damage. When Raleigh and the rest of the co-conspirators were put on trial, he spoke in his own defense, including answering some questions about his actions back in the Siege of Smerwick in 1580, his response to these questions about whether he had acted appropriately was basically that he was following his commander's orders. On November 17th, Raleigh and the co-conspirators in the main plot were found guilty and sentenced to death. About two weeks later, Cobham once again retracted a lot of the accusations that he had made against Raleigh. So it's not really clear whether Raleigh had any involvement at all in the main plot, even this whole question about whether he was trying to get a pension from Spain. But regardless of that question, he was definitely guilty of treason under the terms of the law at the time, because the Treason Act of 1531 included in its definition of treason this, quote, "...when a man doth compass or imagine the death of our lord the king." That was treason. Raleigh had definitely been really vocal about his dislike of King James and his general ill-wishing of the monarch, so even though his definitely real imagining of the death of the king was basically just a bunch of idle griping among his friends, it still counted as treason under the law. On December 9, 1603, Walter Raleigh and the other condemned men were taken out to the scaffold one at a time to be executed but each one was given a last-minute stay and sentenced to imprisonment instead. Raleigh was sentenced to life in the Tower of London. He spent the next 13 years in prison in the Tower. But honestly, this was a pretty luxurious incarceration. He had a large apartment suite with live-in servants, and a laboratory, and a library, and daily visits from his wife and their son, Walter, who had been born in 1593. They had a second son in 1605 while Raleigh was still incarcerated, and the rest of the family moved into a home on Tower Hill to be closer to the incarcerated Walter and make it easier for all these daily visits to happen. Raleigh spent a lot of this time writing while in the Tower. He wrote a morality book for boys called Instructions to His Son, and he also wrote The History of the World, which started with creation and went to the Second Macedonian War in 146 BCE. He dedicated it to James's son, Henry, who he also tutored while imprisoned. Henry advocated for Raleigh's release, but died in 1612 before he had secured it. Yeah, this, uh, this History of the World was five volumes, something like a million words long and was clearly meant to be the first in a series that was going to then go on to cover the rest of the history of the world after 146 BCE. Finally, in 1616, Raleigh convinced King James to let him out of prison. James needed money, and Raleigh made it sound like he could locate riches in South America based on his previous voyage along the Orinoco River. He was given leave to do this on one condition— that he not attack Spain in any way. 
the Anglo-Spanish War was finally over, and James did not want to do anything to start it up again. Plus, Spain had insisted that if Raleigh did cause any trouble to its subjects, that he would be sent to Madrid for trial. Raleigh was released from the Tower on March 19th of 1616 at the age of about 62. But this voyage went terribly. Raleigh was on board as a civilian, and his friend Lawrence Chemis, who you'll also see spelled Keems with no I in it, was the one in charge. I like how just not leaving the I in there is a running theme in names in this episode. <laughs> Chemus attacked the Spanish colonial town of Santo Tomé, killing its governor, which was literally the thing they were not supposed to do. The younger Walter Raleigh was also with them on this expedition, and he was killed in the battle. Also, they didn't find the gold mine that had inspired them to go on this expedition in the first place. Raleigh berated Chemus so incessantly about the death of his son and the failure to find a mine that he took his own life. Raleigh wrote a massive apology for this whole incident on the way home, and once he got there, he tried to use his illness to buy himself some more time, but Spain demanded retribution for what had happened on this voyage, and ultimately, Raleigh's death sentence from the main plot back in 1603 was reinstated. He was taken to the scaffold outside the Palace of Westminster on October 29th, 1618. He gave a speech before being executed, which was typical, but he didn't admit any guilt or ask for the king's forgiveness, which was not typical. Instead, according to newsletter writer John Pory, the speech began, quote, I give God thanks. I am come to die in the light and not in the darkness. And then he went on to justify what he had done and forgive his accusers, but also to deny his own guilt for a total of about 45 minutes. It went on to be a very dramatic and theatrical execution. Raleigh refused to warm himself by the fire that was there specifically for that purpose. Reportedly, he also asked to see the executioner's axe, and then after looking at it, he said, this is a sharp medicine, but it is a physician for all diseases and miseries. He comforted the executioner before placing his head on the stand, and then when the executioner didn't immediately begin the whole beheading process, Raleigh said something along the lines of, strike, man, strike. Then it took two blows to decapitate him. A bystander reportedly said, quote, we have not such another head to be cut off. Again, in the words of John Pory, quote, every man that saw Sir Walter Raleigh die said it was impossible for any man to show more decorum, courage, or piety, and that his death will do more hurt to the faction that sought it than ever his life could have done. Raleigh's body, minus the head, was buried at the Church of St. Margaret's Westminster. His head was placed in a red leather bag and given to his widow, Bess, who reportedly kept it for the rest of her life, which was 29 more years. Often this head is described as having been embalmed, and there are reports that she might have kept it in a glass case and not in a bag. There's, like, this is one of those stories where I kind of go, for real, this seems a little fishy to me and maybe (laughs) apocryphal. But their son, Carew, took possession of this head reportedly after his mother's death and then had it buried with him when he died in 1666. At least that is one possibility for the location of Sir Walter Raleigh's head. St. Mary's in West Horsley has also said it is the resting place of Sir Walter Raleigh's head because Carew had it buried there when his own sons died during a plague. So it is unclear, but there are multiple sources that say his head stayed separate from his body and got carried around for a couple or three decades. Uh, I'm I'm a little lost in thought over what one would do with the head of your beloved. Um, like, do you look at it? Do you just leave it in the bag and pretend it's not there, but know it's there? Like, I don't, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, that, there's a lot of debunking about various things about Sir Walter Raleigh's life, but this head, I did not find any debunking of. <laughs> Today, Sir Walter Raleigh is one of the ghosts purportedly haunting the Tower of London. He also reportedly haunts Beddington in South London, where he owned land and where his wife had requested to be buried after the execution. There were also rumors that he was actually buried there in secret. During his life, Raleigh had not been particularly beloved by the public at large, but his execution, as indicated by some of the quotes we read earlier, really earned him a lot of sympathy. So much sympathy that the Crown commissioned its own write-up of the execution, which made him sound arrogant and combative instead of gallant and poetic. 
This didn't really work out, though, and public opinion grew that Walter Raleigh had been unfairly sacrificed to appease Spain and that England had lost a worthy gentleman by executing him. His popularity really grew after his death, partly because he was so emblematic of this idea of a Renaissance man and an Elizabethan knight. He was handsome and valiant and chivalrous, and he was a writer and a statesman in addition to being an explorer, so he kind of had this whole very romanticized package, especially if you overlook some of the other parts of his life, like the massacre that he helped orchestrate. And all that brawling. I'm still back on Brawly Raleigh. Um, which brings us to that cloak story. It is probably apocryphal, but it has really stuck around. And it's often repeated as fact. I know I heard it, like, as part of a lesson in elementary school. Oh, yeah. On how to remember who he was. I found it in very reputable websites as, like, a real thing that happened. Yeah. And a big part of that is because based on Raleigh's personality and everything we've talked about today, you can think, yeah, but he would probably be the type of guy who would do something kind of uh, not just chivalrous, but also a little showy that way. Like, that's kind of a showboaty move to be like, no, no, walk on my beautiful clothes. (laughs) And this cloak story, the earliest record of it we have, is from History of the Worthies of England, written by Thomas Fuller in 1662. Since it's such an iconic story, it seemed like a good way to end today's show. So here is how Thomas Fuller recounts it. Quote, This Captain Raleigh coming out of Ireland to the English court in good habit, his clothes being then a considerable part of his estate, found the queen walking till meeting with a plashy place. She seemed to scruple going thereon. Presently, Raleigh cast and spread his new plush cloak on the ground, whereon the queen trod gently, rewarding him afterwards with many suits, for his, so free and seasonable, tender of so fair a foot cloth. Thus, an advantageous admission into the first notice of a prince is more than half a degree to preferment. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.